Okay, so let me, uh, let me start with uh, thanking everyone for staying so late uh, and moving into uh, Tygenix. And again, as I mentioned this morning, we're a public company, so I'm going to be making plenty of forward-looking statements. If you're going to make an investment on the company, just look at the registration documents. So, what is uh, Tygenix? So we're a, a public company. We're based in Leuven. We have uh, our operations as well in, uh, in Spain. We are approximately 50 employees, probably will be 55 by the end of the year. We are traded on the New York Stock Exchange in Brussels with a market cap of uh, just over 100 million, uh, with uh, a very good shareholder base, with 30% of the company in the hands of uh, three well-known names. 20% is uh, Grifols, the uh, world leader and more derivative company, and then uh, both the Roche Venture Fund and the Novartis Venture Funds have about 5% of the company each. And then we have a 70% free float, of which a big proportion is in the hands of other institutional investors, and the rest is in the hands of uh, retail investors in Belgium. We had six analysts covering the stock, four of which are independent, and two of the six are based in the US. And we had about $30 million available at the end of uh, June, which is just enough to get us to the uh, key milestones that I will be covering in, uh, during the presentation. So um, I already presented this morning the pipeline, but I would like to spend now a little bit more time explaining what we have. So we have uh, one uh, uh, platform of uh, allogeneic adipose-derived stem cells, from which we have uh, three products uh, in development, depending on uh, how we administer the cells. So we have 601, our most advanced asset, which is a local injection of the cells for the treatment of, uh, of uh, complex perianal fistula in Crohn patients. Then we have the intravenous administration, which we're developing for uh, both early rheumatoid arthritis and severe sepsis. And then we have the intralymphatic administration, CX621, which uh, you know, we're putting on hold for the time being because we don't have the resources. But you know, we did a phase one uh, clinical trial and we, we would develop it in the future for other autoimmune indications. Finally, we have Condoselect, which is our uh, uh, autologous chondrocyte product, which was, as I explained this morning, the first cell therapy product to be approved uh, in Europe uh, in 2009, and that we uh, announced the partnering of the company in June to uh, Swedish Orphan by Vitrum. And, and by the way, you know, I'm going to spend all the time discussing uh, 601, uh, which is our, our most advanced asset. I would love to have some of the pictures that some of my, the previous speakers uh, show, but uh, I will stay with the graph, uh, given the nature of the disease. Um, and these complex perianal fistulas are these connections between the rectum and the skin through a non-anatomical channel. And when they compromise the sphincter, where they have multiple tracts, when they are recurrent and usually are associated with an abscess, they are considered to be complex. And despite, as you've seen, that we have orphan designation in Europe, this is a pretty large uh, market with about 100,000 new patients every year developing uh, these complex perianal fistulas. What happened to those patients today and how they are treated? Well, unfortunately, they go through a series of, of products. First, they get antibiotics to control the infection of those analapses. Then they will go through immunosuppressants. None of these two groups, of course, has any healing power. Most of the patients that will then get infliximab, Remicade, you know, a small compound, about 3.5 billion in sales. Um, which is the only of the anti-TNFs today in the market that has the indication of fistulizing Crohn. Despite, if you see, very limited efficacy data when you look at remission. So patients get better, and that's the reason why it's used. You know, you reduce inflammation, they have less pain. Uh, some of the fistulas do not drain, but the fistulas remain open. And you need to keep treating those patients forever with these uh, compounds, which have some serious adverse events, as, uh, as you know. Patients that do not respond on the treatment of Crohn to infliximab may go to uh, Humira, Adalimumab, uh, and for the most severe cases, if nothing works, they will have to go through surgery. Now, doctors try to avoid surgery at every cost because it's uh, what they call, it's a great disease to lose your reputation. Very few patients are happy, and a lot of the patients, about one third, will end up with anal incontinence, and we're talking young patients here. So nothing that really works. How big is this market? You know, people get obsessed on the uh, central point of the graph, which of course is made for that. But the idea is to give an idea of how big this market is. And you know, if you, you get rid of the patients and assuming that every single patient that gets those fistulas will be treated with anti-TNF, and will, you know, we assume that 20% of those will then be cured, 
there's still 77,000 new patients every year available for therapy. Let me tell you, those patients are not in their houses, they are in the hands of doctors, they are today in the hospitals because they have a very severe disease. Just assume a very, uh, I think, uh, conservative market share and, and a price that comes out of a very you know, significant pricing market research that has been done with both doctors and payers. And you, know, you end up with a product that has a very, very nice commercial opportunity. And at those prices, this product will have a very significant and attractive commercial margin on top of the cost of goods. So it's expensive to manufacture, but you know, it will be very profitable. As I explained this morning, this is uh, the work of you know, 14 years of work. We started with an autologous product, then we move into the allogeneic. And what I will concentrate is on the data we have today on the allogeneic compound. First, we did a phase two clinical trial. Those were patients, very severe patients with Crohn that have their fistulas open that were treated with infliximab. And despite treatment with infliximab, the fistulas will not close. So after a washout period, we forced the patients to withdraw from infliximab. The reason being we wanted to ensure that any efficacy that we will find was to be due only to the treatment with 601. So we treated those patients that had, in some cases, several fistulas, and we were treating only one. So again, you're going to see that we will have some control data because the treated fistulas versus non-treated fistulas on the same patient is a great way of showing if you see efficacy in one of the two cases, that indeed it's due to the uh, 601 treatment. You know, primary endpoint was uh, safety. So first, let's go through the um, safety. Great safety data. You know, very favorable side effect profile. Only two patients had uh, serious adverse events. One, one was an anal abscess. The other one was fever. Probably both more related to the uh, disease itself than to the treatment with the, uh, with the cells. So very nice and favorable side effect profile, if, especially if you compare with the severity of the uh, biologics that are used. What about the efficacy data? And this is a, a pretty complex uh, slide that I will try to um, guide you through. So we're going to go left to right. Left first is the reduction in the number of draining fistula. So as infliximab, the first thing that we were saying is like, okay, does it work? Do some of the fistulas that are draining, all of them were draining, and do patients that have draining fistulas benefit from getting 601? And you see that adding whether you get one or two less draining fistulas, you know, almost 70% of the patients got benefit out of the treatment of 601. So fine, you get the fistulas not draining, which infliximab can do as well. Can we cure the fistulas? Can we close the fistulas? And again, that's the graph in the middle that shows that out of the patients that stay in the trial, 56% of those fistulas that were treated were closed. That is, you know, almost three times the efficacy two and a half times uh, infliximab uh, closer rates. And then the one on the right is an important one, very difficult to explain the way it's, uh, but this is the way it was reported in the paper, which is forget about the ones that were treated. Let's look at all the fistulas, treated and non-treated, how many closed? And you know, I will spare you the maths. What I can tell you is that not a single non-treated fistula healed. So 56% of the fistula close with 601, 0% of the fistula close when 601 was not applied, which is a great placebo uh, control. So that was the efficacy zone in, the, um, in this patient population. We then, also in parallel, because the uh, rectovaginal fistulas were, explained, were uh, excluded from the trial, we uh, had an investigator in the trial in 10 young female with rectovaginal fistulas, which are considered to be the toughest ones to heal. Those patients, the majority of them had several previous surgery trying to close those fistulas through a, you know, a, a surgery a procedure of doing a flap trying to close the fistula without success. All 10 patients were going through, go through a colostomy. We uh, include them in this randomized, in this uh, investigative initiated trial, received just one single dose of 601, and we followed the patients for a year, single injection. Well, after a year, seven patients that came to all the visits, four had their fistula completely closed. The other six, even the three that didn't come into all the uh, trials, uh, we know avoided the colostomy. So again, extremely uh, impressive data. So with that data, we went to the um, EMA, said, what do we need to do to get this product approved? And we agree on a single pivotal phase three clinical trial, given the orphan designation, that may allow us to file if positive. The trial was started in July, and we announced recently that we are almost there on recruitment. We said more than 95%. I haven't checked today, but must be over very soon. 
And these will be patients that have, again, up to three fistula tracts. We're treating every single tract with a single dose of 601, and we're going to be measuring, uh, you know, closer rate as the primary endpoint. Now we allow, on a real-life uh, trial, we allow patients to stay on their current medication just to avoid the number of dropouts that we had on the phase two. Uh, this trial is, uh, has been recruited in 52 uh, centers in seven European countries of the Western world, plus Israel. Where are we on the trial and what were the statistics? So we were following, we're going to be following the patients every six weeks. Primary endpoint is at week 24, but then there will be a secondary endpoint at week 52. This is an extension of the trial to ensure that the, uh, we have sufficient long-term data on the trials. It's a blinded assessment with a centrally read MRI as well. And uh, this, as I mentioned, is a power at 80% with a p-value of 0 0.025. And this is to compensate for the uh, single nature of the trial. We're trying to find a 25% absolute difference between placebo and the cells. So if placebo stays at the, uh, which we believe will be very optimistic, but it stays on the 15%, which is the current uh, literature uh, rate on non uh, previous failure, which is the case, then we will need only a 40% success rate on the, f on the uh, cells arm to show that the statistical significant results. As I mentioned, recruitment is almost done and the data will be available June, July next year. If positive, that will allow us to file uh, in Europe uh, towards the end of uh, next year, beginning of 2016, for a launch in 2017. So 601 has the, we believe, the potential to become the first allogeneic stem cell compound to be approved in Europe. What about the US? Uh, as we're here, we agree uh, with the FDA. We had a meeting in December of last year uh, and we got positive response of, from the uh, FDA that we, all we need to do in the US is another phase three clinical trial. So uh, we started then the development. We were selecting our CMO, which will be announced hopefully shortly. We've put together a very impressive advisory board and we will be presenting an SPA before the end of the year. As soon as the uh, tech transfer is finalized, we will do the second phase three clinical trial and hopefully file uh, immediately thereafter. So basically this is uh, Tygenic, you know, one phase three asset finalizing phase three in Europe with a very clear pathway uh, to US approval as well, you know, with a very nice in, uh, extra pipeline asset, which is 611 being developed for both severe sepsis and early rheumatoid arthritis, all based in our own proprietary technology platform. We have our own manufacturing facility and we've already made it already in Europe. So we know how to take a product all the way into the market. Thank you.